continuing to look at David, and we're going to be back a little bit in the David and Goliath story, but I want to start out this morning digging into one of, one of the great Psalms. We're going to start by reading the first six verses. It says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship you in your presence, O God of Jacob. And yesterday we talked about the priorities and posture and practices that David used to put himself in a position to have victory through God against Goliath. And today as we look back a little bit at the David and Goliath story, we can see that there are other fights, other battles that David had to fight before he even got up against Goliath. There are three battles that he had to win before slinging the very first stone that brought down the mighty giant. And one thing that you guys should know and understand is that the devil is cunning, that he is smart, and he knows that God is mighty and he has felt the sting of defeat. So one of his best plans for us now is to keep us from actually engaging in the battle. Because he knows the truth that, that God is strong. But there's no chance of him losing if we never engage in the fight. If the battle never happens, he can't lose. He wants to trip us up and knock us out before we even step into the ring. And the same was true of David concerning his battle with Goliath. You see, David's priority, as we discussed yesterday, was his closeness with God. And that was the key to his success, the foundation for his strength in the Lord. He was close, close to the one who never loses and the one who never will lose. So how does the enemy knock us out before we even begin? How does he knock out someone who's a follower of God and who's backed up by the invincible champion who never loses. The key is to get him away from God. Separate him as much as he can from the one who can't be defeated. Because God is all power. All powerful. From David's own mouth in Psalm 24, which we just read, it says, the, the earth is the Lord's and everything that is in it. God is unmatchable. He owns everything. There is no one like him. And who can be near to the Lord? Again, from our psalm, those whose hands and hearts are pure. Those are the people who will have the Lord's blessing. Those are the people who will have a right relationship with their Savior. They will be in his presence. So... The devil, our intelligent adversary, has now discerned his goal and his plan from God's own word. To break down David, he must get David away from God by dirtying up his hands and his heart. And before he fought Goliath, there are three times recorded in scripture where Satan tried to derail him, distract him, and move him away from the battle before it was even fought. First, Satan attacked David's character. The Bible says that David's older brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, and he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. So David's brother is coming to him and he's saying, what are you doing here? I've seen you shirk your responsibilities in the past and those weren't even big responsibilities, just taking care of a few little sheep. You've made big mistakes. You're a messed up person. You're sinful. You're proud. And even to be here, 
you're in the wrong. Something is wrong with your character, so just go home. This isn't the place for you. So, for us, we, we can identify the challenge here. His brother, someone who knows him well, is telling him that he is sinful. His brother is saying, your hands aren't clean, your heart isn't pure. Uh-oh. That's a problem because we know, and we just read in Psalm 24, that it's the pure who are near the Lord. And this is a mighty attack because David knows that he can't win without the Lord. A shepherd boy doesn't defeat the giant. It can't happen. He knows that he only can win through God defeating the enemy without him. So if he is impure, if there's something wrong with his character, he's not going to find victory. But Satan continued to attack. The second thing he attacked was, was David's capability. And it comes from the, the words of Saul. And it's kind of a one-two punch because it, it's right after his character was attacked by his brother. It says that David's question about, about, the, about Goliath the Philistine was reported to King Saul and the king sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way that you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. You hear what he's saying here? You can't win. To even think that you can is ridiculous. It's impossible. And this plan is perfectly executed by Satan, this attack to come against David. Saul is a military man who had been in battles before, and he knows for a fact that David has no chance. Saul is also the king. He's an authority figure who David honors, and he's worth listening to. And he's saying to David, listen to me. You can't do this. Saul also knows David well from his previous interactions. They had spent time together. He was aware of who David was, and he was aware of what David was capable of doing. And he was aware that one of the things he was not capable of doing was winning a one-on-one -on -one battle against the mightiest warrior in the world. And when you look at all that, that's more than enough pressure to stop a person in their tracks. There is no reason to fight, Saul was saying, because there is no reason to think that you could ever win. David was being challenged not just on the level of his character through his brother, but now he's being challenged on the level of his capabilities through Saul. The king, the one he was serving and following, was telling him bluntly that if you think that you can do this, that is ridiculous, so just stop. And Satan continued to attack. You know, many people, especially in this, in this battle, in this time, talked a really good game, but then they quit when the pressure came. Their confidence fizzled. So Satan's third attack against David's confidence looks like this. David arrived at the perimeter of the camp, as the army was marching out to its battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle formation, facing each other, and suddenly the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words, which David heard. And when all the Israelite men saw Goliath, they retreated from him, terrified. So there's this big shift here. All these men, you know, they, they were going out, they're ready to fight, and they were, they were about to, you know, get into it and do what they needed to do. And then all of a sudden they hear Goliath say what he always said. And their mighty battle cries got muted. Their, their confidence to go into to the battle and move forward died. And instead of charging ahead against the enemy, they ran away. And David had the same chance as all the other Israelite men to do this. When he was about to face Goliath, it says that Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roared at David. That you would come at me with a stick? 
And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. Yikes. You know, that, that would be scary. This giant guy, bigger than anyone you've ever seen before, uh, with better armor and bigger weapons than you've ever seen before, standing in front of an army uh, back there that's ready to back him up, points at you and says, I'm going to rip your body apart and feed it to animals. And that's going to be fun for me. And it's going to be fun for all my guys to watch. And that's what's going to happen. Kind of intimidating, really scary, and totally a chance for him to turn back. In fact, there's no need to do anything crazy, and it wasn't going to be embarrassing because the whole Israelite army did it every day. They all went forward like they were going to fight Goliath, and then he said these kind of words, I'm going to destroy you guys, your God is a joke, you know, I'm, I'm going to feed you to the birds, and they all went, okay, maybe tomorrow. You know, they, they left. Their confidence was completely shaken for days, weeks before this, every man had turned away when Goliath had threatened. And David had the same opportunity. And you know he might have been thinking, perhaps it'll be better for me to come back another time when I have you know, some sneaky plan figured out. Or you know, he's pretty strong, so you know, if, if the guys can just keep him distracted while I do some P90X and I'll get big and then I'll come back and, and then I'll fight him because I'll be ready. You know, he could have been thinking all those kinds of things, but but that's not what happened. And he went on to, to win this, this battle against Goliath. But we need to recognize that he fought these three battles beforehand. And the devil's plan was really a good one because it, it had worked on the whole army. There's no reason for Satan to think that David was going to stand out or be different because this was like his, his magic you know, spell, his silver bullet, that all Goliath had to do was threaten and everybody, everybody started becoming terrified and turning away. Why wouldn't it work on David? Because it was the ultimate pressure, you know, seeing this massive spear held by this mighty man being insulted and threatened through this deep voice, seeing that impenetrable armor Everyone was shaking in their boots. David should have been running for the hills, maybe wetting his pants, you know, trying to come up with an excuse to get out of there. And we know how the story ends. But before moving on to see how David overcame these challenges, I want to get into a little bit of, of why it is so important to fight these battles and why Satan was interested in derailing David and why he might be interested and coming against you, um, have the attention of the enemy. Why, why did the devil want to break down David and, and keep him from fighting Goliath that day? And the answer is in the outcome. Because Satan didn't want the world to know that there truly was a God in Israel. He didn't want that to be clear. So, why does he want to derail your life? Why does he want to break you down, distract you, hurt you, keep you from doing what God has called you to do? And the answer is the same, because he doesn't want the world around you to know that there is a God in your community. He doesn't want the world around you to know that there's a God at your school, or there's a God in your family, or there's a God in your friend group with your peers. Satan doesn't want that. And there's a lot on the line, because... We, you, are fighting the same kind of battle that David was, where Satan will come at your character, that he will attack your capabilities, and he will attempt to diminish your confidence. But thankfully, God has demonstrated how we can, like David, overcome these attacks through him and move forward in what he's calling us to do. David overcame through God's power, not through his own, and you can do the same. And so let's look a little bit on how. And I just want to give you like a, a little memorable uh, three words that we're going to dig into. So here, here's the game plan for how to overcome these attacks. Three words. Repent, rely, and remain. 
Repent, rely, remain. And the first one, repent. When your character is challenged, just like David's was by his brother, what we need to do is to get right with God, to turn to Him. If you remember what we read right in the beginning from Psalm 24, who can go up the hill? Who can ascend? Who can come close to God? Only those who are pure. Well, if you're a child of God, you can be pure. But if you look into your heart, if you look at your life, you will recognize the very clear reality that you are not. That you sin, that you have evil inclinations, that your attitudes are messed up, that, that what you want to do and who you are is broken. And yet, in God, you can be pure. 1 John 1 tells us, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But, if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. The great thing about repentance is not that God all of a sudden um, makes it so that you can't make any mistakes or anything like that. What He does is He gives us his perfection and makes us right because of what Christ did for us on the cross. The key here is that God is faithful and God is just. And when we turn back to him, he makes us right. Hebrews 4 says, Since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same things we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive His mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. This is a great, great passage to understand in terms of repentance, because you can come to God and turn to Him, not because you've earned it, not because you're good enough, but because God has made a way for you. Hear what I'm saying some of you guys struggle with guilt and shame. God is bigger than that. You don't have to clean yourself up or make yourself right to come to Him. Because you can't. Jesus died to take away our sins because we could not take them away ourselves. And you can repent, you can turn to God, and you can be made pure. And this will overcome the attacks that the enemy has on our character. Through the cross, we can come boldly before Christ because of Christ. Do you hear that? We can come before Christ because of Christ. We can be close to God. And when the enemy says, you aren't good enough, our reply is, but my high priest is. And when the devil attacks with, look how far you've run from Jesus and from his power, you have no chance. Our response is, look how far he ran to me. Those who repent, those who turn from sin, those who turn towards Christ can find purity given as a gift from God. Character restoration, character renewal, something that is amazing and something that we could never do on our own. And God is always there and he is always close and he is always ready to accept. The Bible teaches that nothing can separate us from God's love, not even our own sins. And the power of the cross and what Jesus did there through the mighty gospel of God has turned Satan, the roaring lion, into someone who is still loud, but who has no teeth. He can no longer harm you. There is no power in sin. There's no longer fear in death for those who are right with God. So what he wants to do is what he did to David. He wants to challenge you to never fight the fight. Because he knows that because of Christ, if you turn to God, he has already lost. If you failed, come back to God. Be restored. Turn around. You haven't gone too far. And it hasn't been too long. 
And God is big enough, strong enough, kind enough to accept you back if you repent, if you turn around and seek to, to have that right relationship with Him. He will give you pure hands and a pure heart because we can't generate those things on our own. That's how David, uh, that's how we can be like David and overcome challenge to our character. But Satan will also, as we, as we read about, attack us in other ways. And the second thing that we want to look at is, is the ability to rely on him. When our capabilities are challenged, we can rely on God. Because the truth is there are things that we cannot do, but there are no things that God cannot do. You are only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. His answer is so great. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. And when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he defies the armies of the living God, the Lord who rescued me, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. David wasn't relying on his abilities to defeat a giant. He was relying on God's abilities to defeat the giant. God can fight his own battles, and he will. And those of us... Those of you can rely on him because he has decided to use his people, his church, you, to do mighty things. And who God chooses to use will not fail because God does not fail. Are you catching that? You can rely on God because he has specifically chosen you to do what he's called you to do. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't fail. So if he's chosen you, if he's assigned you, if you do what God has called you to do, you will not fail. Because if you did, that would be God failing, and he never, ever does. Who can stand up against him? No one. So if the living God is alive in your life, who can stand up against what God has called you to do? No one. God will not call you to do something that he doesn't empower you to do. And finally, our last part of the strategy is to remain. When your confidence is challenged, remain. You know, Goliath yelled at David. He said, come over here. I'll give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals. But David replied to the Philistine, you come at me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. This is the Lord's battle. Hear this. If you are the Lord's, the battle that you fight is the Lord's battle. You find yourself struggling to follow Christ? Recognize, this is not your battle. This is the Lord's battle. And when you follow him, you can recognize that he rescues his people. That's what God does, and he doesn't lose. And the enemy wants you to think that you are fighting for the Lord, like he's enlisted you to do some work for him while he's off somewhere else. That's not how the Christian life is. God hasn't called you to do something for him. He's called you to allow him to do something through you. Do you understand the difference? It is very significant. You aren't working for God. Okay, you're not some employee who can mess it up and get it wrong. God is working through you. And if you remain confident in God's power, God's design for your life, if you stand firm on what he has taught you, and if you press hard into his relationship with, uh, into your relationship with him, you can be so confident, so confident at all times, no matter what the enemy brings your way. 
Psalm 24 that we started with has a great end. And here's what it says. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the King of glory. The Lord of heaven's armies. The Lord strong and mighty. The one who is invincible in battle. That's the one that you can rely on. That's the one that you can remain confident in no matter what comes your way because he is on your side. David experienced great victory through the power of God over Goliath and the designs of Satan. And you can experience victory in your life too, but not through your power. Through the power of God, the power of the one who is invincible. So here's my challenge for you as we end today. Consider, where are you being challenged right now? Where is the enemy coming at you? Is your character being attacked? Are you being tempted and pulled into sin that you need to turn away from? Is someone telling you that you're, you're not good enough or that, that you can't do what God has called you to do? because you've messed up in the past or because you know, you're not as good as somebody else or something like that? Is something broken in, inside of you where you have been far away from God and where you have compromised your character and you haven't turned back to Him to make things right? I would encourage you today, repent. Are your capabilities being challenged? Is someone telling you, you can't win? Do you have a King Saul in your life or do you have a King Saul in your own mind saying, if you think you can do this for God, you're ridiculous. Is it time for you to rely on the fact that the idea of us doing anything for God is ridiculous, but the, the fact is that God can use even people like us to do great things for His glory? And if your confidence is being shaken, or you know what you need to do, and you've set yourself on the right path, but you're starting to wonder... Is it really going right, or is God going to let me down, or am, have I been confused? How can you find what you need to be encouraged to truly rely on God? The King of glory, the Lord, strong and mighty. That God will not fail you if you trust Him. He will not fail you. God, the Lord, invincible. I would encourage you guys today to really consider how you can be like David, to repent, to rely, and to remain confident, not in yourself or what you can do for God, but in God's power to do great things in you and through your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you haven't called us to work harder for you, that you haven't called us to do better, but that you've called us to come close, that you've called us to trust, and that you've called us to be amazed because you are a God who does amazing things. And we ask that you would help us today, uh, each one of us here, to be people who are close to you and people who are confident in you. Do not let the schemes of the enemy derail us from being the people that you've called us to be. God, we want to be close to you. We want to follow you and we want to serve you. Show us today more deeply what that looks like in each of our lives. And help us to have great joy and trust in who you really are the Lord, strong and mighty, invincible in battle. Thank you for being a great God, and thank you for being our God. And it's in Jesus' powerful and undefeated name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much.